Uh, Cheryl Kirschenbaum is with us. She's the author of a new book called The Science of Kissing, What Our Lips Are Telling Us. Cheryl, welcome to the program. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for joining us. You, you say in the book that uh, 90% of people can remember their first kiss. We asked around the office here. It was 100%. Uh, <laughs> why is that so uniquely memorable? Uh, well, actually, I think that you're referring to uh, it was we can remember up to 90 percent of the details. And it is almost this universal experience that it makes such a vivid memory for us. Uh-huh. Part of it is that we're engaging all of our senses in a kiss. So all of a sudden we've gone from kind of figuring out what someone's about just using our eyes to using our sense of smell, our sense of touch, getting to know them in so many other ways uh, and using all of these as signals to help us decide what to do next. And more importantly, a kiss is a really powerful way to assess compatibility with a partner. So we're we're focused on that behavior to try to go back later on and think a little bit more about what happened, what that's about, and whether we should pursue a deeper connection. And I'm assuming this isn't just compatibility as in, hey, this guy's a good kisser or this woman, you know, whatever. Uh, The the studies that came out, geez, five, six, seven years ago about how people with um, the greatest g- genetic similarity were the least likely to find each other attractive when they were exposed to the body odor of the other person, even though they didn't realize that's what it was. I mean, it was like, you know, cotton swabs out of their nose kind of thing. And been reading the literature. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the people with, with a greater genetic diversity, although there were limits to that genetic diversity, um, mm-hmm. were found each, found the other person more attractive. And, and, you know, the, the obvious, uh, evolutionary advantage of that would be to to increase genetic diversity, which is always a good thing for any species. Is I'm assuming that in kissing, there's enough of an exchange of body fluids, and that those body fluids are hitting enough receptors, and from the olfactory bulb to the tongue, you know, to the to the taste buds and things, and and perhaps even far more subtle things, hormones that the body's reacting to systemically that that's what you're talking about? You're not talking about, uh, gee, I don't like the way this person's mouth bumps up against mine? (laughs) Well, I think all of it's involved. I mean, the experience has to do with both what we're consciously aware of. You know, do we like the person? Are they making us feel pressured? Is this a comfortable environment? All of those factors can play into whether stress is involved because the stress hormone, cortisol, and kissing do not mix. But what you were talking about before, this region of our DNA, it's called the MHC, the Major Histocompatibility Complex, that codes specifically for our immune systems. And so the advantage of finding someone uh, with diversity in that region from your own would be you'd have, uh, you know, healthier, stronger children more likely to survive. And so there's a lot going on beyond our control, but that makes us feel like a kiss is going well, like this is someone that we want to be with. And, And what I learned from doing the research is really trusting our bodies is, is a good way to go. I mean, not all the time. There's you know, shared values and a lot of other factors involved when deciding to be with someone, but our body has evolved to have so many natural ways uh, of telling us what to do in the relationships that are meaningful in our lives, not just romantically, but also mother and child, you know, parent and children, uh, all sorts of other important relationships. A kiss brings two people together in a very significant way. And, and there may be secondary pieces to this. Um, I, I, again, there was research some, some time back about the, the high levels of zinc in, um, in semen and how that seemed to affect mood in women, the, that it was, this is like actually a transfer of nutrients in a certain way. And, and kissing, you say, actually transfers testosterone, which is, a, you know, the male hormone. Why would it be a value for women to acquire tes- testosterone from a man in a kiss? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm, I'm actually not familiar with the zinc study, so you have me wondering what that's it's, about. You can Google yeah. it. It's fascinating stuff. This is... Yeah. Uh, see, I'm, I'm learning something new just by coming on your show. Uh, well, the, the open mouth kissing was that. So there were these, there's this very, very strong gender divide between men and women in kissing attitudes and preferences. And initially, it kind of annoyed me because so many of the answers seemed stereotypical of men and women, and it looked at college students. So I felt like it was a very limited research. And I can, I can talk a little bit more about that and why it turns out this, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye, meets the lips. Uh, but with open mouth kissing, men tend to over and over and over uh, convey that they prefer open mouth, saliva, you know, lots of, lots of tongue when they mm-hmm. kiss a woman. And women are always complaining about too much tongue. <laughs> and on the surface, that's just kind of a silly observation or a silly survey result. But 
uh, men actually do transfer small traces of testosterone through their saliva to a woman, and women are very sensitive to this male sex hormone. And so it can serve over weeks and months, not instantaneously with a, the person you kiss that day, but uh, if a man is kissing the same woman over time, probably or possibly can ha- enhance her libido if other things are going well and uh, make her more receptive to sex, which would be to a man's advantage. Right. And, and to, again, to an evolutionary advantage. Uh, mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is fascinating. How are our brains involved in this? Your chapter 10, this is your brain on kissing. We have about a minute left here. Uh, uh, Sure. sure. Well, I, you know, our lips are so packed with sensitive nerve endings, so even the slightest brush is going to send a cascade of signals to our brains, to our bodies, and really uh, reinforce the behavior when it's a good match. So dopamine can go up, get kicked into high gear, make us crave the other person, can't mm. wait to be with that person's sensation. Uh, oxytocin is the love hormone sure. responsible for bonding. All of these chemicals in our body really, really are fostering this important connection, and similar to the symptoms that we describe as falling in love in the way that we respond. And so there's so much more going on during a kiss, but if anything, you know, writing about this made me appreciate why it matters so much more. Yeah, it's remarkable. Is oxytocin the hormone that's associated with lactation and childbirth yes. as well? Yeah, that's the same uh, one. my, the my same recollection. One. so important yeah. in maintaining relationships throughout our lives. It's, it's remarkable. We are bundles, we're biological bundles, the, you know, with, with all these, these, uh, these chemicals that, that actually can transmit feeling, emotion, and, and uh, a, a sense of reality without any nerves, you know? It's, it's just purely chemically. It's, it's re- remarkable. Cheryl Kirstenbaum, uh, Kirstenbaum is the mm-hmm. author of the new book, The Science of Kissing, What Our Lips Are Telling Us. Cheryl, thanks for dropping by today. <laughs>